Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 655 of the Juice Box Podcast. On today's show, we're going to be speaking with Trace Beasley. Trace is the Director of Clubhouse Operations for the University of Alabama baseball team, and he has type 1 diabetes. If I'm not mistaken, we're all supposed to say Roll Tide. Please remember while you're listening today that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Please always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you have type 1 diabetes and are a U.S. resident or are the caregiver of someone with type 1 diabetes and are a U.S. resident, please consider going to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Join the registry, fill out the survey. The whole thing will take you fewer than 10 minutes. When you do this, when you complete that survey, you'll be supporting the podcast and supporting people with type 1 diabetes. The questions are easy. The entire thing is HIPAA compliant and absolutely anonymous. You'll be happy you did it. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Dexcom, makers of the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor. Learn more and get started today at Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. The podcast is also sponsored by Omnipod, makers of the Omnipod Dash. Find out if you're eligible for a free 30-day supply of the Omnipod Dash at omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Hello, my name is Trace Beasley. I'm a baseball manager for the University of Alabama baseball program, and I have type 1 diabetes for 14 and a half years. 14. How old are you now? I'm 23. You were nine? I got it. I was diagnosed. Two days after my ninth birthday. Ooh, no kidding. Happy birthday to you, Trace. That's uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah what, a, what a wonderful gift. Um, yeah. Was there, um, well, no, was there's the wrong word. Like, I mean, nine years old is pretty young. Do you have any recollection at that time at all? I just remember um, I was in second grade and coming back after Christmas break, going back to school. I just remember just not being myself at all Mm -hmm. just i've always been a kid that enjoyed going to school um just never really like i I woke up and be like i don't want to go to school today just just tired of it and then playing literally baseball growing up i remember just in the middle of games having to go use the restroom probably about five times just during a game it was just and i would drink three to four bottles of water during a game just to, cause I was so thirsty. Yeah. How long did it go on for before you were diagnosed? Do you think? Um, I'd probably say about three months, no kidding. Three to four months. Did you lose a lot um, of weight? I lost 20 pounds. So I was 75 pounds. And then I went to 55 pounds real quick. And I don't know how parents are like, you know, how this happened. I was like, man, I have no idea. Are you, um, you have any brothers or sisters? I do. I have a sister. She older or younger? She's older. Okay. I mean, that's a that's a lot of weight off a twenty pound off twenty pounds off a of a ninety pound frame is a significant amount of weight. You must have looked like a a skeleton. Oh, I was tiny, very very tiny. No kidding. Um. So your parents take you to the hospital to the doctor. Do you remember any of it? So, my birthday is May twenty first. Then I was diagnosed on May twenty third, two thousand and seven. So I remember May 23rd, um, actually the night before I went and spent the night at my grandparents' house, both my parents are teachers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the last few days of school, when you're in elementary school, you know, you really don't have to go because, you know, elementary school don't have finals or anything like that. But my parents, they were teaching high high school, so they had to give final exams. So I remember... On May 22nd, I went and spent the night at my grandparents' house, and I remember waking up at 1 in the morning. I went and uh, woke my 
my granddad up and I was telling him I was so thirsty. Well, me and him go in the kitchen. I had 10 cups of water that night because I was so thirsty. Yeah. Then my grandmother, she walked up and she heard us in the kitchen. You know, she was asking, you know, what was going on. And my granddad told her what was happening. And then that it didn't matter what time in the morning it was. My grandmother called my mom and said, you need to take Trace to the hospital. Something's wrong. Yeah. You were probably dying, man. Right. Yeah. Were um, you in DKA when you got to the hospital? When I went to the doctor, my blood sugar was 536. Yeah. Plus, you would, it yeah. sounds like it had been going on for quite a little bit of time, too. Right. Yeah. Wow. How long were you in the hospital? For four days. So what's it like then when you're done and at the hospital, the hospital stays over and you come home and you have to manage diabetes? Now, we're talking about, what year was this? Was this 2000? 2007. Seven. You were diagnosed just after Arden. How long have you had? You've had diabetes 14 years. You're about May, June, July. You're, you're not quite a year behind my daughter uh, as, oh, far, wow. as far as length of time. She was diagnosed August 2006. So, yeah, you're only maybe maybe eight, nine months after her. And you were nine. She, she was two. So, um, I mean, I remember. So this is interesting because you're, what'd you get? You got, you get needles? And a meter, and that's about it, right? That's about it. Yeah. When I got out of the hospital, I was on four shots a day. I didn't know what a pump was. I didn't know what a Dexcom. I don't even know Dexcom was a thing then. It was but... back then. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I had no idea what a Dexcom was, or nobody did. Um, I was on four shots a day for six months, and <clears throat> be quite honest with you. Me and my parents got pretty tired of me just having four shots a day because, you know, growing up, I was trying, you know, get my weight back and everything. And it's hard just to be just eating um, just ham and cheese, just, you know, no carb diet for snacks. And it's pretty yeah. hard when you're trying to get your weight back. So, Trace, was that, were you using a slow acting insulin too? Or were they? I was using a fast act. It was pretty much like my meals. Oh, so you, at, oh okay. But they didn't give you a basal? Night, I believe, yes, sir. I believe they did. Oh, okay. Okay. Then at night, when I took my last shot before I went to bed, it was a uh, long-lasting insulin that helped me through the night. Okay. So the basil they gave you at night, but they limited you to four, would they just limit you to four meals a day? Or really, it was just pretty much three. Three. My three. My three meals, then my last shot was at night before I went to sleep. They wouldn't let you correct the blood sugar, so you couldn't, you couldn't do another injection or have a snack or something like that. No, sir. Oh, how long did that go on for? About six months. <laughs> then <laughs> my my endo he introduced me to a. We were like we're pretty we're tired of shot, so parents were like, "Hey, you know, let's see if there's another thing that we can do." And he says, "Well, how about a pump?" And then once I got my pump, I've been on it ever since. Yeah. Which one did you start with? Uh, Medtronic. Are you I still, still have? Yeah. I still use the Medtronic today. Nice. Um, well, wait a minute. That's that, but that summer must have sucked. <laughs> oh yeah, it was it was brutal. <laughs> having to learn, you know, having to change, you know. Like I remember my first time I ever went low, my, my blood sugar dropped. I remember that. It, it was it, like the weirdest feeling in the world too. I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. Well, you're just old enough to really be aware and not really old enough to help yourself a whole lot. It's a, I mean, it, nine is young. Did you try to play baseball that summer? I did. I finished, I ended up finished my season. I missed about, I think three games in those four days I was in the hospital. Mm-hmm. But then once I got back, it was, it was hard to get back in the swing of things. But then once I, after a few at bats, I think I got my, I got everything back under control. Figured it out, yeah. Wow, mm-hmm. that's crazy. All right, so you've been pumping for your almost your whole time, right? Okay. Do you um? Well, I, I mean, I'm going to stay with there. Let me stay there for a little while longer. So, what what was it like growing up with diabetes and you know going to school and how did you guys manage all that? When I was going to school at at my elementary school at the time, I was the only 
kid with type one diabetes in the whole school. So it was, <clears throat> it was pretty hard at times because, you know, growing up you were like, you know, why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to, you know, miss class, go check my blood sugar and, you know, all my friends are, you know, playing at PE and, you know, I'm having to go check my blood sugar pretty much every 15 minutes. I'm outside just to make sure I'm okay. But then at the time I was, you know, not very happy that I was diagnosed with it. But then now looking back, I wouldn't change it for anything. No kidding. Um, at the time, not happy just because obviously it made you different and gave you something to do when you're lugging your pump around and everything. But why, why in hindsight would you not change it? Because Top One Diabetes has given me a platform to help younger kids today and be able to help inspire the next generation of young kids that have that grew up with Type One Diabetes. I know it's very difficult at first, but then realizing you know you can do anything you want with this with this disease, and this has helped me tremendously. And growing up, and I've helped. I've been able to help out at diabetes camps growing up in high school and just now being with the University of Alabama baseball team now just giving me a platform a little bit just to help yeah. share and give back to anybody else that has diabetes. Do you have, um, have you ever uh, since then, like coming up, have you ever played with or gone to school with or, or managed at a place where there were other people with type one? When I, Finally got to middle school, there's another um another kid about four years younger than me uh had type one diabetes in my elementary school. So it was me, then it followed. Yeah. Do you guys did you guys become friendly? Or we did, did you, yes, sir. Yeah. Do you still know him? I do. Yeah, I imagine you might. Um how do you end up doing what you're doing for a living like is it do you is it a sports management degree that leads to this or yes sir um it's actually a funny story um i actually stopped playing baseball when i was about 10 or 11 years old because i played football and basketball as well and i honestly just thought baseball was probably the most boring out of all three just a lot of standing around and you know football and basketball is pretty much high high tempo getting up and down the court and I was, you know, you get the baseball and it's just, you know, a lot of just standing around a lot, a lot of times, but then actually my, going into my senior year of high school, you know, I really didn't know what I knew I was going to go to school, but I just didn't know what I was going to go for, but I knew I was going to go to junior college because I had, I went to a small high school. I didn't have, all the credits or anything like that for, I guess, the university yet. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had to go to junior college first and junior college helped me tremendously. Um, so my junior college, I went to Bevel state community college in fed Alabama. They going to my senior year of high school, they didn't have sports at all in 2011. They shut down all sports teams. I still don't know the reason why that happened or anything, but, they shut down all sports in 2011 and then 2017 they said they're bringing all sports back so my mom she teaches math at bubble state and she knew the the head baseball coach that was going to be the coach my freshman year of college and he was like he came up to my mom one day and was like hey uh what's your son doing next year she goes well, he's coming here, but I think he's just going to do school and work. Probably think about it. But he was like, "Well, how would he like to be my one of my baseball managers?" Wow, and that's, that, how, that's, and that's how it pretty that's much how it started. started. Like, I went to junior college for two years. Um, you know, I was out out of baseball for probably about seven, seven, eight years. And you know, baseball is a game where. You have, I mean, there's just a ton of stuff that you have to be in the game to know about. And honestly, I was very far behind. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, Bevel State, they helped me tremendously learn about the game more. They helped me um, basically start my career off. And I got free school for two and a half years, and it was was awesome. Oh, wow. Oh, because you worked for the school, technically. Yes, sir. I worked for the team, and it was a full-ride scholarship, and I took it, and... Yeah, it was the best thing that 
happened for me at the time. No kidding. That's a wonderful. That really is. And then after you finished up there, you went and did two more years somewhere else? I uh, actually I went I started at I went to Alabama. Yes, sir. I went to University of Alabama and I got in touch with their director of operations, uh, Jack Hill. He's he's awesome. He's one of my bosses for with the team and he I got in touch with him and now I'm this is my second year with the University of Alabama. So So you working and going at the same time? Yes, sir. So I'm the baseball manager slash clubhouse clubhouse guy. So I make sure everything inside like the facility and clubhouse, everything is stocked up with food, protein shakes. Um, I help, I help out with the equipment operations as well. I put out jerseys, help out, put jerseys out before games, um, help out with laundry schedules and I do laundry for the team. And at the same time, you're working on your degree same time working on my degree yes oh, that's excellent but you're gonna get through school without owing anybody a nickel huh right yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all right i'll take that for Man, sure that's fine i mean yeah it's yeah. a lot of work but at the same time i have this has been the most enjoyable two years of my entire life like i growing up i grew up in tuscaloosa i mean i went to probably i've been to 100 football games 100 basketball games 100 baseball softball games and just growing up like my goal was never to make it like pro. It was always to be like either play for Alabama or work mm-hmm. with Alabama athletics. So that's, that was my goal. That's now um, I'm I'm living the dream. So. Yeah, Trace, that's <laughs> well that's well done, man. Like it really is. It's um I've uh friends locally whose son really wants to do what you're doing, you know. And uh freshman year he showed up at his college and went right to the baseball stadium and sat outside the gate, just sat there and watched practice. And he did it day after day until somebody walked up to him and said, son, what are you, what are you doing here? You know? And he's like, I want to work for the team, you know? And, and now he does. It's uh, it, he really, he started off by just, he picked any baseballs that went out of the stadium. He'd pick them up and bring them back. And then one day they were like, well, hell, if he wants to do it, let him in the stadium to do it, you know? And then it just, he mm-hmm. just built a relationship with people and, and, and got it done. It's, um, it's not a common pathway to something, but I mean, if you want to do something enough, you, you find a way to, to do it, you know? Right. And you, you make as many con- connections as possible and it, and it don't matter where you start out. I mean, I started at a junior college program that, my summer of my senior year, we were out building batting cages by hand and putting up the outfield fence by ourselves because mm-hmm. they didn't have a team for six years. So we had to build pretty much build everything back up from scratch. Right. You must have raked a lot of dirt. Oh, it was a <laughs> lot. It was a lot of work. But now they now if I go back to a game or something, I look and be like, Wow, man, like I helped put this team back together. So that's probably most satisfying thing in my entire life was yeah. to help yeah. put that program back up and countless boys will play on that field for years you know and and you had a part in it I, we used to drive through a town my father grew up in and he'd point to a restaurant and he'd say that when he was in high school they were building that restaurant and he worked there and he could tell how proud he was that the building stood there and he had something to do with it you know um mm-hmm. that's really cool yeah that, that's that's excellent hey did you um Arkansas and Alabama are pretty close together. Were you aware of Patrick when he was diagnosed when he was playing for the Razorbacks? So you've decided that you don't want to do injections anymore. You don't want to carry a pen and you want a pump, but you don't know which one. And it feels daunting, I would imagine, to just pick one. Well, because what if you're wrong? Right? You don't want to start this big whole process with something and then find out, I don't like this. That, I think, is just one of the reasons why Omnipod offers a test drive. Actually, you may be eligible for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash, and there is but one way to find out. You get on your little browser machine, the computer bits, maybe even your phone, and go to omnipod.com forward slash juice box. That's all you have to do. You go there to find out if you're eligible for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash. 30 days 
will give you more than enough time to decide if you like the Omnipod. And if you don't, it's cool, no big deal. But if you do, and I think you will, it is very simple to keep the whole process going. And just like that, you've made a decision, made sure it was the right decision, and moved forward. Look at you. You're an adult. Well done. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Give it a whirl. See if tubeless insulin pumping is for you. And I mean, how could it not be, right? No tubes. You can swim and bathe, participate in sports and other activities, all without ever taking off your pump. That's not something you can do with a tube pump, but you can with the Omnipod. For full safety, risk information, and free trial terms and conditions, you can also visit omnipod.com forward slash juice box. All right, now you know what pump you're getting. You need something to go with it, right? You don't just go out and buy a new bag. You get shoes, too. Am I wrong? Of course I'm not wrong. Dexcom, that's what you want. A continuous glucose monitor. You want to be able to see the speed, direction, and number of your blood sugar at a glance on your Dexcom receiver or your Android or iPhone. This seems obvious to me, but maybe it isn't to you because maybe you don't know about it. But you could know about it. You could go to my link, Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. I'm going to tell you how we use the Dexcom tonight couple different ways. Arden came home from school. She wasn't feeling well, and she took a nap. We were able to make adjustments to her blood sugar while she was napping that allowed her to sleep for an extended period of time with a nice stable blood sugar. Could do that because we could see the data coming back from her Dexcom. Later when she woke up, she had some sort of a weird spike in her blood sugar that we didn't understand. I don't know where it came from is what I'm telling you. And we were able to aggressively correct it and get it back down without causing a low. We did that with the data that we have from her Dexcom. Those are some high-level ideas. But day-to-day, just seeing your blood sugar and how it reacts to insulin and food, it informs you. It allows you to understand the bigger picture. And when that happens, managing insulin can begin to feel intuitive. You can start to see what's about to happen. And get ahead of it. Not only that, but Dexcom has alarms and alerts that you can set that help you understand when your blood sugar is rising or falling. And up to 10 people can follow a Dexcom. That could be your spouse, the school nurse, your mom, your dad, whoever. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Do yourself a favor. Go take a look. It was a funny story about that. So last year we played at Arkansas, but since it was my first year with the team, um, I didn't get to go to travel to all of the road trips. I only got two, mm-hmm. but I didn't get to go to Arkansas. So that Friday night opening game of the series, me and my girlfriend are here at my house. We're watching the game, and all of a sudden they do a, like a little story behind Patrick, and he's pitching first game of the series and they talk about him being type one diabetic and everything else. And we're like, Oh look, he's, he's diabetic. (laughs) And it's, it's pretty cool to be like, Oh wow. Like he's like, he's like me. So um, then after that story, I reached out to Patrick on Twitter just being like, Hey, um, I heard about you being a type one diabetic. I think it's awesome that you're, you know, you're getting the pitch in the best conference in the, in the whole entire country. And I wish you the best of luck. And, me and Patrick actually were diagnosed on the same day, just 13 days apart, 13 years apart. No kidding. You know, I, I was would, I was just talking to him last night. It's the only reason why it's in my head. So um, that's crazy. I had no idea. And his blood sugar, I believe, he said on your show, his blood sugar was 535 and mine was 536. <laughs> yeah, one well, just one crazy. after. Yeah. One after. <laughs> just one after. One year, one, one point. Uh, that's a that that's a small world situation there. That really is. I just mm-hmm. he messaged me last night. He wants to come back on the show, and I I owe him a I owe him a message back. And he's in my head, and you know me. I'm like I'm I'm sitting here. You're talking. And I'm like I think Arkansas and Alabama are pretty close to each other. <laughs> and I'm right, trying yeah, to picture they... I'm trying to picture the map in my head before I ask you. And I was like, they're just one state apart or two, maybe. So, um, 
Oh, that's crazy. I, I, it just, uh, I mean, there's nothing like if you're going to play college baseball, playing it in the South is, um, it's just a dream come true. It really is. Um, uh, I know for a number of reasons, it was hard for my son because they don't really reach too far North for players. And, um, any places he got, uh, he, he got a couple of, um, of offers down South, uh, to play D one ball, but they were, the schools were so small and they didn't, they didn't hold up academically to what he wanted. And, you know, you should have seen us sitting here, you know, with a, a 16 and a 17 year old kid telling him like, I can't let you go there and play baseball. Like you're not going to, I need you to go somewhere where you're going to get, you know, a degree that people are going to look at and think, well, that's, that's a good reason to hire you one day, you know, and he could never get into the, you know, he couldn't get the bigger schools to, to, to offer him. Um, but he got a lot of the smaller ones. And in the end, the argument was down to, I just want to go down where it's warm and play, you, you know, like it would seem so important. Mm-hmm. And, and we held him back from that. I'm sure he's probably still mad at us to some degree. Um, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really, if you play baseball, you know, you're in the part of the country where you want to be. That's for certain. So, um, can you talk a little bit about what it was, what it's like to enjoy a game, have played it when you were little and be around it now, but not be a player? Do you feel that brotherhood or do you feel on the outside of it? Do you feel like management or do you feel like part of the team when you're there? A little bit of both, to be honest with you. Um, I know every guy on the team and they treat me just like anybody else. I mean, they'll me. We go eat dinner together at the dining hall. We all sit together. Um, I help out with the equipment, so they I'm the guy they come to and ask for a new pair of batting gloves if they need it. Um, yeah, uh, during baseball games, I help out with the umpire. Like I go get fi- I go get foul balls if they hit it to the bat stop. I'm the guy that goes and runs out and gets it, then come right back into the dugout. Uh, during like when the team switching innings, I go out and umpire be like i need three more baseballs i give it out i give him more and then if he like can i get a, a drink of water and i go out and tell him a, <clears throat> give him a drink of water then it's back to the dugout trace when do you study and sleep uh is any time you have a little bit of time like uh we played last night i got home about 7 30 and it was i had a, two assignments due and you have to just time management is very key I would imagine. You still have that girlfriend? Do you ever get to see her? Oh, yes, sir. I do. She's oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where you're making time because a D1 schedule, you guys are going to play. Will you play 50 games? 56. 56. And you're already 10 in because it's warm there already, right? Yes, sir. And this yeah. past, last weekend, we played at the University of Texas, which was awesome atmosphere. Oh, and you're and you're traveling. Bus trips, a couple, three hours. Uh, Texas was 10 and a half for <sighs> me and the other managers. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing about that, though. Like, growing up, now we can talk about that for the rest of our lives. But, like, hey, you remember that time we drove 10 and a half hours to Texas and 10 and a half back? So, yeah. My um, uh, Sunday night, we left uh, Virginia. My son was playing in Virginia, and we t- we left and drove away, and the bus left, and they went in a different direction. And about an hour later, I get a text bus broke down <laughs> oh man it's like i was like uh-oh and he goes new bus gonna not get here for three hours <laughs> and uh, i was like what are you guys gonna do and he's like, he's like i have no idea so they got the bus started enough to drive it like another like thousand feet and um they could walk and uh he's like the entire team is in a chili's right now <laughs> and uh he's like he said they spent like three hours in there and he was irritated because he's tired and he wanted to get back and everything. But at the same time, I, I take your point. I bet you 20 years from now, he's going to remember that bus breaking down and sitting in that restaurant with those guys, you know? Right. It's just traveling and everything with the team is one of my, the biggest blessings that I've ever had in my lifetime. Just, you know, like you can look on youtube and see like day in the life videos of teams and everything and that was me growing up i was like man i wonder what it's like to travel with their, all these college teams and professional teams now i'm getting to live in, and it's like wow like yeah. i get to do this <laughs> well wow, that's really great you think is your goal to stay in college doing what you do 
Yes, sir. I mean, I'm you know whatever God has for me is what I'm going to do, and you know if it's college or professional, you know I'm fine with both. But you know whatever God's plans for me is, I'm willing to do what's that's wonderful, what's okay. best. So let's talk about your diabetes a little bit. I mean, you have a. I mean, we've described now an active day. You know, you're not just like up and awake. You're moving. I'm, I'm assuming it's warm in Alabama. Um, you know, like how do you manage day to day? Are you eating on a schedule? Is the pump, uh, are you using a 670 G? Medtronic? I, I have a, the mini med. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. So it's a 670 G. It's a mini med. It's that one. Um, then I also use the Dexcom G6. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably my best friend <laughs> just to <laughs> I'm moving around so much. And then yeah, I can just, you know, look at my phone and be like, Oh, what's my blood sugar right now? Then I can, you know, just see and be able to give corrections and that sort of thing. So you're just, you're just paying attention. Like you're just it, nothing special. You're just living your life. Listen, Trace, the reason I bring it up is because I think you're a great example for people who are afraid that maybe they or their children you know, can't be as active with type one, but it sounds to me like you get a minimum amount of sleep. You're going to classes. You're, you know, you're going from being incredibly active, running around in a baseball game to sitting on a bus for 10 hours and you're not, you're, are you having any trouble managing or are things going okay? You know, I'm, I feel like I'm just like every other type one diabetic. You know, I have my bad days and I have my good days. You know, some days, you know, I'm, I mean, yesterday before a game, I uh, dropped to 85, but then all of a sudden I uh, went and got a juice from the athletic trainer, and then after that I was good to go. So, I mean, it's just – You just keep going. Just keep going. Yeah. That's you get- the thing. Just – no, I'm not going to sit out for <clears throat> for the team or I'm willing to do whatever they need me to do to get the job done. Yeah. I enjoy your attitude about this and, and it's why I wanted to bring it up. So I think sometimes um, people can kind of get in their own heads a little bit, you know, and, and scare themselves, but um, it's do It's very doable. I mean, listen, we just brought up Patrick Patrick's uh, I think yesterday was his first day at spring training. He's at spring training for the Tampa Bay Rays throwing a baseball. That's not easy. And, uh, and he's doing it. You're doing the thing you're doing. Uh, there's plenty of people out there with type one, who are uh, living lives that are, you know, uh, vibrant. And um, and I wouldn't want other people to think it wasn't possible, you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can do, anybody that's watching this, you no, know, you can do anything with this disease. I mean, anything you put your mind to it, you can do it, yeah. regardless of any circumstance. I agree. You just got to be flexible, right? Arden started a, yeah. um, uh, she has to take a, what am I thinking of? Uh, oh, my God, a steroid pack for six days well yesterday she took the you know took the first few pills and then the next couple in the first day you take a lot of them and i'd say inside of about four hours i had to double her basal like her basal rate is like two units an hour right now which is is literally doubled from where it was um and i wasn't even scared of it when the doctor gave it to us she's like her blood sugar is going to be high while she's on this steroid pack and i said no it isn't I was like, oh. <laughs> so I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Um, and and you come to realize while you're doing it, I mean, it, it's a leap of faith to double someone's basal insulin, you know. But I just turned it up. It didn't work. I turned it up again, and I just kept pushing it up until I got it to a place where it was it was holding where I wanted it to be. And um, I know that would be a hard thing for most people to do. Most people would probably listen to the doctor and say, "Oh, my blood sugar is just going to be crazy for the next few days," but I thought I don't care if it's I don't care if it's pizza or it's running around in the heat or it's a steroid pack. There's an amount of insulin somewhere that's going to work for this, you know. And uh, right. I was determined to find it last night. Uh, but I I don't, and dude. I, I it's really terrific what you're doing. Any other people in your family have type one or other autoimmune diseases? The last person I could think of that had type one diabetes in my family was my dad's first cousin. Uh, it probably took your parents by surprise then, I would imagine. Oh, it was like a total, just total 360, just, I mean, I was a healthy little boy, then all of a sudden, bang, just. Yeah, little skeleton playing <laughs> baseball. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. What about um 
thyroid or celiac or anything like that? No, sir. No. Okay. No more sweet tea. Huh, Trace? No. No. <laughs> Milo's yellow cap is my favorite. I'll tell you, you know what? Uh, we were just um we were just in Georgia recently where my daughter's thinking of going to college. And so you would you drive in south and there's somewhere you hit. I didn't exactly remember where it was, but somewhere you hit, and once you go into a store to buy a drink, the concept of diet is gone. They you know what I mean? Like they don't this the, the stores mm-hmm. don't carry a ton of like diet versions of things or or no it's um it's interesting, especially iced tea. Uh, but you say you have one. My what is it called? It's called Milo's. Milo's, okay. I'll look for that Let's next see. time. It's a yellow cap. It's a, it has a, it's yellow because it has a Splenda sweetener in it. Mm -hmm. And it's, I've been on to, on that ever since I've been diagnosed. And it's, you know, all this stuff now with the NIL um, things for college athletes. Um, Milo's, if you're listening to this, I would love to have an NIL deal. (laughs) I don't know if they would sign a manager, but you know, hey, I'm willing to do, you know, Change it up a little bit. Trace, you're willing to run out and get those baseballs holding an iced tea? <laughs> hey, whatever, whatever it takes. <laughs> Trace is trying to get through college, everybody. He needs a he, he needs somebody to come along and help out a little bit. No, I was just uh we were somewhere middle of the, like I mean, we drove down, man, it must have taken us fourteen or fifteen hours to get to Georgia because we hit traffic at some point. And uh we stopped somewhere where I was so dizzy by then, like I went into the store and Arden and I went in to get a drink and, and use the bathroom. And, and I said to the guy at the register, I was like, where are we? <laughs> I don't like, I don't even know what state I'm in, you know? And I think he said, he, I think we were in South Carolina at the time. And, uh, I said, is there like, can we get a diet drink here? And he goes, no, sir. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, so we grabbed some bottles of water and we took off, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was really interesting. Um, Wow. So, um, do you ever feel like, I mean, you just said you one, you met one kid in school, nobody in your family has diabetes. No one on the team has it at the moment, anything like that. Like, does it ever feel isolating or do you ever feel alone or do you not think about it like that? I really don't think about it like that. You know, I'm just, I just feel like I'm just one of the guys on the team, um, a little bit, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I have this disease. I have to take care of every single day and make sure I'm healthy, but players and everything else, you know, they'll see me snacking, you know, if I'm low during practice to be like, Hey, you good. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Just give me about five minutes and I'll be right back out. Just, <laughs> but they, they first day of team practice last year, you know, I was introducing myself to, to all the players and everything. And they were, you know, they saw my pump and they were like, no, what's that? And, it's a funny story. A few years ago, Alabama baseball had a type one diabetic on the team. His name was Keith Holcomb, and he played football and baseball for Alabama. And he he was probably one of the <clears throat> best baseball players they've had in a long time. And so the guy, some of the guys were aware of it, or uh, just what they, diabetes in general? They were just like they were aware of it a little bit. They just didn't really know a lot about it. Yeah. But but some remember them being, oh, I remember Keith Holcomb. Didn't he have diabetes? I was like, yeah, that's him. And I've been fortunate enough to meet Keith before, and he's awesome. He's also huge. I just Googled him real quick. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's he's a big boy. I was going to say, he's a mountain. Look at him. Jeez. Uh, 6'4", 235, he was listed at his last year at Alabama. <laughs> that's, a, mm-hmm. that's big. Um, <laughs> so... So you said just a second ago, if, if you they see you eating something or doing something, there's some concern. Guys pass by you, they check on you, stuff like that. Yes, sir. Yeah. And even the other managers too. They're like, hey, um, I remember one day, like my pumps like just came, uh, fell out of my arm. They're like, hey, you need to go. And I was like, yeah, just I'll be right back. And <laughs> I went and put a new side in. Then I was right back to practice. You ever grab a glove and shag flies or try to jump into BP? Oh, yeah, sir. I get to shad BP. Um, us being managers, we actually get to customize our own glove with the, within, with the team. So oh. I, I've got been able to get two gloves. And last year, this year, I got outfield glove just to be able to shag better. So it's awesome. <laughs> That's excellent. Oh, no, I know. I was <laughs> just thinking about my son. He would just like, you know, if he wasn't on the team, I wonder. I always wonder about baseball. Like if, if 
you know, if or when he has to stop playing, like if he'll try to find a connection back to it or if if it'll be painful not to be able to play, you know, like I I, I always wonder how that's going to go. You know, you see a lot of pro athletes, they kind of some of them spin out of control when they when they lose the ability to be, you know, be involved with a team. And, and uh, I think they're incredibly uh, competitive people. And then there's nowhere to put that competitive thing. You know, it's a uh, it can be difficult to leave it behind. Um, I, I just wonder. So I was just thinking for you, man, it just must feel like little league all day long, you know, just exciting. Oh, it's awesome. Like I remember my first like, opening day last year, the 2021 season, I was just like in shock just to be like, wow, I'm in the dugout. <laughs> yeah. People attend those games too. They're well attended games, right? Oh yes, sir. We, especially when we play, start playing sec teams. Like last year when we, we play Auburn three game series. It was, it was a big crowd every night we played. I have to tell you, I just remembered something. So, uh, I told you before we started playing or before we started recording playing, um, that my son took off a a semester during COVID and, um, he and, uh, a number of his teammates went out to Wyoming and they snowboarded for a couple of weeks and then they um, made their way back home, but they they did a big long loop south and then came back up the East Coast. And as I'm sitting here, I think they stopped in Alabama and saw a baseball game. I'm oh, wow. I am now sitting here thinking <laughs> that I have a photo of Cole in the stands right up the first baseline at that at one of those games. I'm gonna have to go back and look when I'm done because I'm certain they stopped at a game and now I really think it was with you guys. Isn't that interesting? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is it's interesting. Very random. I think they just, they went through Texas, had barbecue, and then they started heading back up, coming north. And one of their friends is a student there and got them tickets. And that's how the, yeah, no kidding. That is what happened. How about that? Um, wow. So, uh, you so you mix and match. You're using the Medtronic pump with the Dexcom. So you're not using an algorithm. But do you think about ever doing that? Yes, sir, I believe. Um, I would like to get the T-Slim in here in a few years. Okay. That's like one of my main goals because they said the debts come in the T-Slim sort of like connect together, like work together. They do, yeah. So that's something I've been very interested in and getting. But um, I have like two more years left on this pump I have now. So I feel like just using these two years up and then once that's over, just move to the T-Slim. Okay, because you're going to try the out. I'll tell you. Um, Arden's about to start up using the Omnipod version of an algorithm, and uh, we're very excited to to give it a try. Um, Wait till you see it; like it'll fry your mind the first time. Like you you notice on your graph, like you're trying to get low, and the pump takes away your basal, you know, and 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 catches the low before it happens, and suddenly you don't need a snack. Man, you're gonna be like you're gonna be in heaven. You're gonna think that's the most amazing thing that's ever happened. I'll tell you, it's uh. It really is something else. It, it it feels like magic while it's happening. It really does. Oh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm telling you, you're gonna love it. Uh, Medtronic makes one too, uh, but you would need to use their CGM with it. Um, Dexcom works with Tandem Control IQ. Dexcom works with Omnipod Five. Um, so you'd have you have more uh, opportunities there to to choose pumps um, because of the interoperability of them. But oh yeah, I'm telling you, man, you're gonna. You're gonna think you uh you think you died and went to heaven when you see that. It's pretty great. Do you um you're young though, man, right? How old are you? I'm twenty three. Twenty three. You're not thinking about having kids, right? Oh no. No, no sir. No. <laughs> not right now. No. I was gonna ask you if you ever thought about diabetes and having children, but then I realized how old you were and I thought he hasn't thought about having kids once. So. <laughs> oh no. I I graduate in August with my undergrad, then I'll have um five classes left in my graduate program that i'm in so then after that it will be you know trying to find a job in my career that i love and then after that you know just try to step by steps you know yeah no i understand um i guess it's a it's a tough a tough world when you pick a job that there's not that many opportunities for right i mean honestly there's as many college baseball teams as there are i mean honestly at, at most colleges your job might not even exist, right? Cause they don't have the budget for it. So it's a, a finite amount of colleges that, that run the way Alabama does. 
and then minor league and major league baseball teams, right? Those are your options. Yes, sir. Pretty much. Um, you know, just, just, but then again, coming back to what I said at the beginning, just, you know, you just got to make connections and, you know, somebody's going to know somebody and then be like, you know, I got, Hey, I have a job opening. Do you know anybody? And, you know, they'll be like, Oh, I got somebody for you. Right. So that's, you know, just trying to make as many connections as possible when you're in college and, um, bust your tail every single day for them and just do whatever that needs to be done. I, I would guess too, you could, you could get it. I mean, you could leave baseball and do other sports too, right? No reason why. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, with the equipment operations and everything, you know, I'm willing to do, you know, I mean, I'm a big basketball fan too. So, you know, I would love to, you know, help out with basketball. Um, also softball, you know, it's just like baseball, but smaller field and everything. And obviously, you know, girls play it. So, my son met a girl once and he was playing in Georgia and uh, he's like, the guys are going down to the, we're going to hang out in the lobby of the hotel. And I was like, whatever, it's fine with me. I, I just slept. You know what I mean? Trace, I was, I'm old. Like you drag me around to a couple of baseball fields. And I'm, I'm pretty much done. And, um, and he comes back up and he says, uh, I, oh my God, is this Alabama too? Is this story about Alabama? He comes back up. He goes, I just met a girl who is going to pitch at Alabama one day. Um, she's a big, tall, blonde girl. And then she ended up being their main, I'm going to look, she ended up being their main starter. Um, I think recently, cause he's, my son's still a senior. They were the same age, but all he could talk about when he came back up was how tall she was. He's like, she's so tall. I wish I was that tall. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he was young back then. They were still in high school. Um, down there playing and there was an overlap. Like sometimes, you know, there's, uh, people don't know, but like there's places where people play baseball and there's a week of softball and then the softball clears out and then there's a week of baseball and, you know, high school students. And I don't know her name. Um, I feel badly. I'm not going to come up with it, but uh, he was just, I just remember him talking about like how tall this girl was. So do you know, do you know their, their, who are their weekend starters at softball? Do you know? I know one uh, Montana Fouts. Montana Fouts. I'm looking now. I see her. God. Boy, I bet you that's her. I bet you that is her. I'm going to ask him later. Um, yeah, it just, uh, I don't know. I just remember him being like 16 years old and coming down. And he's like, this girl's over six feet tall. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny. And she says she's going to go to, to Alabama and pitch. And then, you know, three, four years later, he's like, that girl I met, like he, she starts for them. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And, and people don't understand either. Like that, you know, this example, I don't know specifics about, but you know, every school tells about 10 kids, they're going to come pitch, you know, and they all show up and, you know, a couple of them pitch and a couple of them never end up doing it. And so it's a, it's a, it's a big leap to make between being a prospect as a high school student and actually playing in the game as a as a college student, it's a uh, it, it's not a you know for anybody listening who have little kids, you know, it, it probably seems difficult just to think to get a college to be interested and to take your kid, and it is it's hard, but oh, it's very difficult. Yeah, you don't just magically play once you show up. That's that's not how it works either. So it's um I'll tell you what I I would imagine that the you take humility out of this almost more than anything else. You, you know, to make it that far, and we've talked about it a number of times, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but I think it's the number, at least when my son was was um, was um a little kid playing Little League, every year in America, four million boys start playing Little League baseball. And when those boys turn 18 and go to college, 9,000 of them go on to play college baseball. That's it. Like, those, that's how the numbers break down. And then you get there. You still might not play, you, you know, it's, right. um, it's a, it's a heck of a climb, you know? Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Like watching it from your perspective? I mean, somebody, not that I would want you to say their name, but someone pops into your head, hard worker deserves to be on the field. There's no space for them. Right. Yeah, obviously. Um, we have a lot of guys on our team. That's like that. Um, the guy that comes to mind is our shortstop, um, Jim Jarvis. He has started at shortstop for us since he was a freshman. 
and he is the probably one of the hardest workers I have ever seen. Um, ever since I've been in college, I mean, he comes up, he shows, he comes to work every day, he comes to practice every day, and he's ready to he's ready to work. I mean, there's no, um, and he's always happy too. Like, I mean, he's never I've never seen him mad or anything like that. I mean, he like he enjoys being at the baseball field every day. Yeah, and that's somebody that you want to be around too because you know baseball. You know, you play pretty much every other day. Yeah, and it's, and you just have to be like a kid in the candy shop every day because of how hard the season is, and you know, like these guys are getting to live their dream right now, playing for the University of Alabama, and us as managers as well, we're getting to live the dream of being with the team. No, I, I listen for people who don't know. I could tell you right now if, if. I think my son would be proud to tell you he was the seventh outfielder at Alabama. You know what I mean? Like it's th- there's guys there that'll that might never even sniff the field who are still going to have that same exact experience of 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 the camaraderie and the um, the feeling of being there. Um, it's uh yeah no there's some there's some places you want to play baseball in college and Alabama is one of them that's for sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. So. Um, what made you want to come on? Like you just kind of want to kind of be a shining light for people. Yes, sir. That's pretty much it. Just to be, um, you know, let other, um, young kids today know that, you know, they can do whatever they want to with this disease. And, you know, I know some days are harder than others, but I know that just keep pushing, keep, keep fighting. And you never know what the plans God has for you. And, you can just do whatever you, you put your mind to. Yeah. And I never thought in a million years, if you told me, Hey, you're going to quit playing baseball at 10, but then you're going to go in college and be a baseball manager, your whole college career. I've been like, you're crazy. <laughs> I never thought of me yeah. growing up, you know, growing up here watching Alabama football my whole life. Um, you know, that's the team that I wanted to play for, but obviously it just, it just wasn't for me, but you know, and that's okay too. Um, my sister, she was in the million dollar band here as a crimsonette here at the university of Alabama. And then my brother-in-law, he played football here at the, at Alabama. So got to experience that side of it as well, but it was awesome. No. Is, was there ever a time where you thought that the diabetes could hold you back? Like, is it something you had to battle through or did you just set your mind to it right away? I just set my mind to it right away, you know? Um, I was growing up, I watched the uh, Jay Cutler play for the, for the Chicago bears. And I knew he was type one diabetic and also, um, Nick Jonas, I heard he was diabetic. So, you know, I saw, I see these two guys, you know, they're doing what they love to do. So why not yeah, why be not able you? to do what I want to do right. yeah. with it? I see that's just common sense to me. I think that's fantastic that it hit you that way because you know, there are, I mean, and you're making the point you want to, you want to let people know they can do whatever they want to do because it, it can be a burden to some people. And it, it does weigh them down sometimes to the point where they you know, lose faith or give up. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how, how to think of it, but um, yeah, I don't see, I don't see how it can stop you if, if, if you, but you still need to understand it, right? Like it's easy to say, like I'm not going to give up. But you know, if your blood sugar is going from 40 to 400 all day long, it's pretty hard to battle through that. Like you have to have, you have to have a, a firm understanding of it and and be able to, uh, you know, to manage it well to give yourself that chance. Do you listen to this podcast with any regularity? Yes, sir, I do. When once you had Patrick on. I was, oh, I got to listen to this. I'll, I got to listen to this one. <laughs> I, got, I hooked you with baseball. You know, I get a lot of later, I get a lot of later letters from mom or like, that's enough of the baseball. <laughs> so I'm like, well, right. yeah, I like baseball. So you got to listen to it sometimes too. Um, but now I'm glad that that found you like that. Have you ever tried like the pro tip episodes or anything like that? The management stuff? Yes, sir. I have. Has it been, has it had any value for you? Yes, sir. It has been just hearing about, you know, different things that, you know, people do and, you know, just try to do it in my, in my time and just do it on my time too. So just whatever, try to, you know, little tweets here and there just to see like if this helps or if it don't, you know, what do you shoot for? Um, like what's your range that you try to stay in? I try to stay in between 120 to about 175. 
Okay. I feel like that's where like um like I'm at my best at during games and everything too. Yeah, because you said something earlier that that caught my attention. You you talked about low being eighty five. Like you said, you got low. You were at eighty five, and I thought, oh, that's not low for for us. But I thought maybe it might be for you. So that makes that makes sense. Boy, I'll tell you, you would really you are gonna like those algorithms because they it's gonna just shoot for like a hundred and ten in that range there, and it's gonna do a pretty good job of holding you there. I bet you an algorithm would. I'm just just based off of what you said. I'm gonna guess that your A1C is like around six eight, something like that. Um, uh, last time it was seven three. Seven three. Okay, yeah, that that space. That's what I'm talking about right there. I bet right. you that algorithm is going to move you down without making you lower than you're comfortable with. I bet you that algorithm gets you more down to like probably the mid to low sixes. I'd bet that'd be that'd be a big deal for you. Oh, it'd be awesome. I would yeah. love to get down to the sixes. Yeah. It's um so let me ask you a question. So do you stay a little higher because you're afraid of getting lower? Or do you stay a little higher because if you don't, you absolutely are gonna get lower? I do try to stay a little bit higher than you know, not go crazy high, you mm-hmm. know, but sure. I try to stay like before game, my blood sugar is one ninety. I mean, I'm not gonna try to do like give a correction or anything like that just because I know if I feel like man, if I get insulin, I'm probably just gonna bottom out during the game so i feel like you know being a little bit higher on the is a little bit on the safe side a little bit but then also at the same time you know you got to know like hey i think i need to give a little bit of insulin here before the game or just be like hey i think i'm okay Mm -hmm. just try to check it in that scenario in that scenario fourth inning um i'm sorry i cut you off but in that scenario does that 190 come down on its own with the running around at the game and everything yes sir it does yeah how far does it come down so yesterday before the game, I was 182. Then after the game, I was 157. Okay. Well, then, Trace, let me be the one to say to you that I bet if you were 150 before the game, that after the game, you'd be 120. Probably so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I am ai don't want to be the reason why the umpire doesn't have any balls, but <laughs> I, do, <laughs> I, do, I do want to say that there's probably a small correction you could make that would – I mean, even if you just t- chop 25 points out of it, I mean, there's a small correction you could make that would do that that I don't think would would cause a low. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yes, it's interesting. How much do you weigh? Can I ask? I weigh 185. What's your basal rate? Basal is about, I think it's 1.2. Okay. 1.2. Hmm. And if, all right, so when you sit stable away from food and bolus, so overnight is, I, I guess, my best question. Like, overnight, where do you sit stable at? Sit stable about around 160 to 190, a little bit. All right, Trace, the next time you have a day off where you don't have to do something the next day, make your basil like 1.4 and see what happens okay. overnight. Just see what happens. Um I, I bet you there's a spot in there where you could cut some points out of your blood sugar. I know you didn't ask me. I apologize. I'm now just giving you like my my thoughts, and I didn't ask you if you wanted them. But we got to fill time, Trace. So you have to listen to me. So <laughs> um, I, if you if you just if you just turn it up the tiniest bit, I think it's possible that you could take some of those numbers out, still stay in the range you mean to be in, and maybe cut your A1C under seven without causing you the lows that you're worried about while you're while you're working. But that's, I mean, obviously that's up to you. I, I, I'm not trying to pressure you. I just think it's possible that that exists. So. Oh, yes, sir. No, it's, I'm going to do, you know, any tips or anything like that just to <clears throat> stay healthy. So I'm going to. That's the whole goal, right? You wanna, right. That's right. Yeah. You ain't worked this hard to get this life so that you, that you can't live it, you know? So for sure. All right. Well, listen, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to? Um. A little bit yeah. about just when I was growing up in high school, I worked a diabetes camp called Camp Soul Harris. It's here in the state of Alabama. Um, they have overnight camps. They have day camps. And I was a camper at first, and I became a counselor at the camp. And I can honestly say Camp Soul Harris was a big help growing up with 
type one diabetes. They helped me tremendously. Trace, I'm sorry. And I know you don't think of yourself as having an accent, but I can't hear the the name of the camp. Spell it for me. Uh, C-A-M-P. Yep. S-E-A-L-E. Then Harris. H-A-R-R-I-S. Got it. Camp Seal Harris. Two words, S E A L E A. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two words. Oh, so big deal for you. Was a big help for you as a kid. Yes, sir. It was because like I said, like growing up, you know, I didn't really understand why, you know, I had to go through this every single day. And then I went to, I had a diabetes checkup with my endo one day and he comes in with, to my room and has the, like a packet in his hand. And it's about Camp Sil Harris. And he goes, uh, Camp Sil Harris is bringing their camp to the University of Alabama for the first time and having they're trying to have a Tuscaloosa a day camp. And it's for three days and it's going to be at the university. And once I went, it was probably the best three days of my entire life. Oh, that's great. Um, I have it here. It's Camp Seal with an E. I'm going to spell it a second, Harris.org. So Camp S E A. L E H A R R I S dot org. Yes, sir. That's correct. Cool. Oh, cool. That's very nice of you to spread the word for them. It, it seems like it meant a lot to you. Do you meet people there that you still know? Yes, sir. Um, me and the, some of the counselors that I met and everything, like we're still in a group message. <laughs> that's many years later, huh? Many years later. I mean, and I've been able to still help out a little bit here and there, not as much as I'd like to, but then again, at the end of the day, they let's. If I were to one day win the lottery, I would give a good bit about of money to them just to help out. That's what. That's how much they mean to me. Yeah, sounds like it was really impactful to you. Oh, it was. I like that was probably the most. When I played football in high school, we got like the one week off to basically do whatever we wanted to before we started uh, fall practice. And that week I was like, they're like, oh, you going to the beach or, you know, you going to Disney World or something. I was like, no, I'm going to diabetes camp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to diabetes camp. <laughs> they're like, why would you go there? I'm like, oh, it's like because there's other diabetes there. I mean, why would, why would you not go there? <laughs> right. Yeah, you get to finally meet people, have your, you know, your similar situation, right? It's, uh, it's almost impossible. I mean, listen, you're as, a, you know, you're open with your diabetes and you know, you don't hide it and you still don't, you don't meet that many people. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to find people that you, uh, that, you know, that you can connect with on a level like that. Right. And I, I remember the first day of camp that I went to, I was like, Oh my gosh, like there's people that have diabetes, like just like me and they're having to fight the same battles that I have to fight every day. And it's like, Oh, my blood sugar went low last night. Oh, you went low. Oh, I went low too. So it's sort of like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some common stuff that you get to talk about. Right. Yeah, no kidding. Hey, I just realized you guys opened against Xavier. Uh, yes, sir. Boy grew up in my town. I think plays center field for them. So uh, I just did, I just realized that now. That's crazy. Uh, Trace, I really appreciate you coming on and, and spending your time with me this morning and and, and sharing all this uh I, I, I appreciate your reaching out and, and the excitement that you have when you're talking about diabetes and, and being open with other people. I think it's really important. Yes, sir. I appreciate you having me on and I enjoyed it. This is my first ever podcast. So well, you I did appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. You did terrific. And you're smart because you're going to move up on the schedule because I will obviously still want to put you out during baseball season. So <laughs> you ain't going to have to wait too long to hear yourself. Um, yes, sir. Thank you. No, thank you. Hold on one second. Okay. Stay with me. Okay. I really love Trace's story, and I appreciate him coming on here and sharing it. I want to thank Dexcom, makers of the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor, for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. And I'd also like to thank Omnipod. You can find out about that Dexcom at Dexcom.com forward slash juice box and the Omnipod at Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. You may be eligible for a free 30-day supply of the Omnipod Dash. There are links in the show notes of your podcast player. 
and links at juiceboxpodcast.com to these and all of the sponsors. Is this where we say Roll Tide again? I'll do it. Roll Tide. Probably sounds better with the southern accent, but I, I cannot approximate that. So Roll Tide. See? Just like that. That's all I can do. Hey, if you're looking for those diabetes pro tip episodes, they begin at episode 210 in your podcast player, or you can find them at juiceboxpodcast.com and at diabetesprotip.com. There are a ton of other series within the podcast off the top of my head, defining diabetes, diabetes variables, how we eat, after dark, algorithm pumping. Mm, I feel like I'm missing something. You want to stay with me while I look? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look. I have to look at my own website. Don't laugh at me. Well, I didn't forget anything. I did good. Look at me. Boom. What do you think of that? I just fell back in my chair. Don't worry. I'm okay. But I'm a bit of a liar because I did forget some stuff. There's a pregnancy series. Sorry. A big mental uh, mental wellness series, a whole bunch of episodes about fat and protein and how to bolus for them. There's the Defining Thyroid series. That one I feel bad for missing. I just completed that one, and I got so much good feedback from people. And we're working on other series that will help you. I think next up, I am i don't think. I actually know because I'm the one doing it. But I'm laying out right now a Defining Celiac series and looking for people to uh, record with about it. So that'll be in the future. Uh, But you're talking about right now. So again, I mean, if you're not listening to podcast player, I wish you would Uh, follow and subscribe in any audio app. Please don't pay for one. You don't have to Uh, Spotify. The free version works great. Apple podcasts, um, uh, Amazon music, the Google podcast. There's a ton of them. They're all free. They all work great. You can listen to the podcast for free. You shouldn't even be paying a couple of dollars for a podcast app. You don't have to. I mean, if you have a favorite podcast app and it costs a couple of dollars, I'm not trying to stand in your way, you understand, but I'm just saying there doesn't have to be any impediment to you getting this information. What else should I talk about here? Hmm. Ooh, you know what? Are you in the private Facebook group? You should be. Juicebox podcast type one diabetes. About 23,000 active members right now. A joint is jumping. You want to talk about insulin or watch people talk about insulin and diabetes and all that comes with it? Head over to Juicebox Podcast. Type 1 Diabetes on Facebook. We add about 300 new members every week. It is a a really lovely, supportive place. Very unlike the internet. Um, And uh, there's something there for you. I promise. Anything else? There's always something else. Later, I get emails from people. You're supposed to mention this. You didn't do that. I'm like, oh, I'm doing my best here. You know what I mean? Um, I'll remind you again to go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Fill out the survey. That's a big help to me and to people living with type 1. You know, they didn't buy an ad on this episode, but the Touch by Type 1 golfing event is coming up really soon. Touchbytype1.org. Head over there and check it out. It's not too late if you're in the Orlando area. I believe you can still play through. What else? What else? What else? Uh, I didn't have time in the ad to talk about Omnipod Promise, but it's a real thing, and you should check it out. And now i got to explain it to you. Hold on. All right, Omnipod, this is a freebie here. I know I talked about getting the Dash, and you might be thinking, but I really want to get the Omnipod 5, so I'm just going to wait. The truth is you don't have to wait. You get Omnipod Dash tomorrow, and the Omnipod Promise says that you can upgrade to Omnipod 5 for no additional cost as soon as it's available to you and covered by your insurance. That's a pretty great promise. I mean, you could have Omnipod Dash for two weeks, and then if Omnipod 5 was available, you could start the process of switching. There's no impediment. You shouldn't be waiting if that's, if this is what you want. Um, I think I am beholden to tell you that... Hold on. This is what happens when I'm not ready to do what I'm supposed to do. I believe that I have to tell you after I say that, that 
I do. I have to say that for full safety risk information and Omnipod promise terms and conditions, you can also visit Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Okay, now I've done what I'm contractually obligated to do. Uh, but it's a big deal for you guys because I don't know exactly when Omnipod 5 is going to be available to you. It could be a month. It could be three months. It could be six months. Like, I don't know how the rollout works. You understand? I don't understand the world. I'm not in charge of everything. What I'm trying to say is I've gotten upset for no reason. You weren't yelling at me. I can't even hear you. Um, what I'm trying to say is I don't know when it's going to be available. But because you want it and it's coming sometime in the future, soon-ish, is not a reason why you should be sitting around not using an Omnipod if you want to. So go ahead and try the Omnipod Dash. Do the free trial. And then loop back around to five when it's ready. Uh, what else? Um, I don't know. I'm very ready for winter to be over. It was so cold here today. And it's just it was unseasonably cold. And it was very unpleasant. I didn't like it at all. Oh, I'm getting knee surgery. Do you care? I tore my meniscus. Um, anyway, here's what the doctor says to me. He goes, uh, 15 minutes surgery. I'm just going to poke two holes in the knee, clean that thing up. Two days on crutches, you'll be back driving in 48 hours. No big deal. That's how he sells it to me in the store, the store in his office. It's the same guy that fixed my shoulder. So I figured, I mean, he didn't do too bad of a job with that. So I was like, I'll let him try the knee too. Anyway, um, then I get the MRI, you know, confirms it and everything for insurance. And uh, he says, you know, uh, no big deal. 15 minutes, poke two holes, clean it up. Uh, just, you know. Two days on crutches, a week icing and elevating, and six weeks of PT afterwards. And I was like, where was the icing and elevating and PT talk back in the office when you're like, oh, go get an MRI. We'll get this thing fixed up for you in no time. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't sound bad. I can ice and elevate and, you know, go up the street to a place and bend my knee for a couple of weeks. I'm up for that. I'm young. You know what I mean? I still need to be active. Um, but anyway, I don't know why he undersold the work that I would have to put in up front. And then, you know, once he thought I was, you know, definitely going to do the surgery, he's like, oh, did I tell you about the rest? I don't know. Seemed a little disingenuous to me. That's the wrong word. I don't know. I didn't like it. It didn't seem like anything. I just thought he should have said it all up front. Meanwhile, <laughs> nothing stopping me from getting my knee fixed because it hurts like a mother. Do you understand? And I can't live like this. So I'm getting this thing fixed up. What else? This is like uh this is like I had a folder full of things to say and I'm just like clicking through them real quick and but that's not true. I'm just running through my brain real fast. What else? What else? What else? What else? I don't have anything. I think I'm done. Do you feel good about this? Do you feel like we've we've done something here? I mean, I appreciate it. Let me thank you real quick for listening, for sharing the show with others, for leaving those great ratings and reviews like way you do. Um Everything that you guys do, it means the world to me. That's it. I'm out of here. See ya.